again to Ivy. Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. The campus has taken on an air of serenity and peace. There are no whistling students or singing co-eds on the streets. All is quiet because final exams are on and the college year is almost over. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy, watches his wife, the former Victoria Cromwell of the English Theater, as she sits on the floor of their home covered with travel folders. Uh, Victoria. Yes, Toddy, dear? Uh, lean the Tower of Pisa the other way for a moment and talk to me. All right. I'll lean it against the Vatican. There. That's cozy for them. Toddy, where would you really like to go this summer? I would really like to go upstairs, stretch out at full length on my beautiful bed, <clears throat> set the alarm for Labor Day, and then not wind the clock. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're tired, darling. But you should get away, you know. Some sea breezes or mountain air to blow away the cobwebs. Yes, I know. But A, I don't see how we can afford to go much further than the city limits. B, it will cost too much. And C... Uh, refer back to A and B. <laughs> We've our lovely savings account. <laughs> My dear girl, don't speak of our savings account in the tone of voice which should be reserved for, for dealings with J.P. Morgan and company. <laughs> By banking standards, we possess what would be roughly the working capital of a badly managed flea circus. <laughs> and it was set aside for a rainy day. Well, we don't have to wait for a cloud burst, do we? I mean, there'll be rain this summer. The almanac says so. Vicky, I'm afraid you're improvident. Would you take our little nest egg and serve it up in one big golden omelette? Wouldn't I, though, with chives? Ah, <laughs> uh, flighty, irresponsible woman. I'll have to watch you like a hawk. And a great pleasure it is, too. <laughs> We both worked hard, and I'm going to see to it that we have all the fun we can. Oh, you do that every day, my dear. Well, suppose we spend the money for a pretty summer parasol. Then when the rainy day comes, we can use the parasol for an umbrella. Oh, I should like to take that question, boil it in a test tube, add a catalytic agent, and, and see if it would precipitate a detectable amount of either reason or logic. <laughs> I'll rephrase it then. Where are we going this summer on our savings account? <laughs> well, now, let's see. How about, uh, for one month at least, not seeing or talking to anyone who even approves of a college education? <laughs> let's romp among the illiterate. <laughs> let's find some congenial group of morons who think that English lit uh, means an intoxicated Londoner. <laughs> Let's refuse to pay our syntax. <laughs> Let us split any unwary infinitive that dares to raise its head among the... <laughs> well, I get it. Dr. Hall's residence. Yes, he is. Oh, hello, Mike. Why aren't you buried in an examination paper? Sure. We'd be delighted to see you. Come on over. Come on. Who's Mike? What does he want? And why isn't it July yet? <laughs> Mike is Mike Candor. He wants to see you, and it isn't July yet because you choose to argue with your wife whom you never ought to and which you should think better of. Your grammar. <laughs> I ended with a preposition, huh? Seems like a dozen of them. <laughs> That's the sort of thing up with which you should not have to put. <laughs> I'm afraid you must have been studying my Fowler's English usage, <laughs> because Fowler English usage I have never. <laughs> let's get back to my candle, Toddy. My candle, now let's see. Oh yes, he's the musical one, very bright, sure to be an honor student. His newest song is number two on the hit parade, and it's the third one that's made it since he's been here. Yes, he graduates this year. Undoubtedly the richest graduate Ivy's ever had. By his own efforts, I mean. 
I think he'll be very famous. Possibly another coal porter. I wonder what he wants. Well, maybe it's just my feminine intuition, but I feel that if you go to the door, you can find out right away. Well, I never underrate a woman's intuition or anything else which is made up of hope, faith, and inside information. <laughs> ah, hello, Candor. Dr. Hall, uh, thanks for letting me come over. Nice to see you. Hi, Mrs. Hall. Hello, Mike. Sit down, won't you? Uh, you, you must be tired after marching all these years in the hit parade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I uh, won't take much of your time, Doctor, but uh, I've got something on my mind. Well, I'll leave you two. Oh, don't go, Mrs. Hall. I've got things to do, Mike. Besides, I want to see if Dr. Hall can run this college without me. <laughs> I'll see you later. Well, Mike. Doctor, um, I've been pretty lucky here at Ivy. Lucky? Well, I know that you love music and have been extremely successful with it. But, uh, Mike, when something is achieved through, through labor, understanding, capacity, and knowledge, the modest man is apt to use just their initials, L-U-C-K. Well, thank you, Doctor, but I'm not that modest. Sure, I've been successful. I was sort of pushed into it. That's how I came to Ivy. Oh, what do you mean? My father, he didn't have a quarter. My uh, mother died when I was a baby, right after Dad brought her to this country. He did everything an honest, hungry man could do, from pushing a cart around to Lancy Street in New York to, to selling papers. Well, didn't you help him? Oh, sure, I sold papers, too. Did all sorts of odd jobs. But every time I tried to quit school, he said he'd knock my block off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good for him. You know, Mike, your father came to this country in search of the very thing he was giving you. He saw a light. The lifted lamp beside the door. A light that seems to be seen better 3,000 miles away than it is from here. I know, the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That's the light your father saw, Mike. He must be very proud of you now. He is, sir. But I, I want to show him how proud I am of him. I've had all the advantages, and he's had nothing. Oh, it's good to hear a young man talk this way. Oh, it's not just talk, Dr. Hall. I've got a crazy idea in my head, and I need your advice. You're the one guy that I can... I'm sorry, sir. Oh, that's all right. I like being called a guy. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I think maybe you'll understand. I've written a check covering four years of tuition at Ivy. And with your help, sir, I'd like to enroll my dad here as a freshman. How old is your father, Mike? Oh, about uh, 60, I guess. Does that matter? No, not as far as the college is concerned. I'm thinking of your father. Will he do it? I hope so. I, I'd like him to know some of the same kind of happiness I've had. Well, of course, I can arrange this, but... But I think that you and I should have both have a talk with him before making a final decision. That's what I'd hoped you'd say, sir. Uh, if, if I can get him to come down to Ivy, will you see him? Oh, of course I will. He'll be down to see you graduate, won't he? Oh, oh wild horses couldn't keep him away from that. <laughs> I uh, thought what I might do is get him down for the prom Saturday night. Well, that's a very good idea. Look, le let's plan to come back here to the house when the prom is over. Thank you, sir. That'll be wonderful. Mike, this... Uh... This crazy thing you're doing restores a lot of faith in humanity to a man who only today was complaining of being tired. He's not tired anymore. Thank you, Mike. I'll be looking forward to meeting your father. I want to thank him, too. Vicky. Vicky, are you ready? I'll be right there. Chaperones at crumbs have to be on time, you know. I'm already tardy. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, ooh, look at you. <laughs> have you ever thought of going into the movies, Dr. Hall? Rather impertinent way to talk to a college president. <laughs> and as for you, you look simply beautiful. Your gown is a triumph. Your hair is perfect. And you are talking complete nonsense. Well... Yeah. If I were a co-ed, or if I had a date with a halfback, and you walked in the door in that dinner coat and black tie, you know what had happened? Oh, uh, what? Boing! <laughs> I just learned it. Do you like it? Well, that's... Uh... 
As depicting the mainspring of a generation coming suddenly unwound, it is, it is definitely onomatopoeic. Ooh, how you talk, Abner. <laughs> yeah, I bought you a carnation. Let me put it in your lapel. Oh, I meant to buy you some flowers, darling. Forgot completely, of course. Well, I couldn't wear them anyway with this dress. There's no place to fasten them. Yes, I wondered about that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Yes. <laughs> you know, Vicky, before you came down, I was thinking about Mike and his father. Yes. Isn't it easy as it looks, is it? Oh, actual enrollment at, I, at Ivy is possible, of course, but what can we really do for the old boy? He's probably had little or no primary education and naturally no credits. Of course, we could overcome that by selecting a curriculum of special courses. I think you're really worried about him. Well, I am. Think about it. Is it possible to be transplanted successfully from... From one background to a completely strange one, once we're grown up? I did it. Oh, yes, you did, my I dear. Know, but, uh, I know, it doesn't apply. We have each other. It doesn't matter where we have to go. Exactly, and Mike's father will be alone. His son will have graduated. And how can he be happy, surrounded by a generation one-third his age? That's why I'm worried. Mm. Oh, and incidentally, Mike is bringing him to the party tonight. Is he really? Come on, then. I know you'll work it out. You always do. Are you going to dance with me? Oh, I imagine so, after I've done my duty dances. <clears throat> Your duty dances? With whom? Well, there's the chairman of the prom committee. Sally Corbett. She's the prettiest girl in town. Uh-huh. And then there are a few girls in Eng English literature who, of course, insisted on putting my name in their program. Oh, uh, they're just taking that course to see you when I'm not around. I know them all, sly pussies. However, I still have one or two dances left open. Hmm. Uh, how about the supper dance? Well, thank you, Doctor. And all the rest? What about your duty dances? These are them. Come on, Vicky. <laughs> curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. No wonder it's the beer that made Milwaukee famous. We'll return to the halls of Ivy starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in just a moment. But first, let's hear the story of how one businessman really profited from an evening's work. Well, I worked late at the office the other night. There was some paperwork that I couldn't put off any longer and a semi-annual report to finish up. About 7 o'clock, I decided to take a break and go down to the restaurant lounge in the corner for dinner. I found an empty table, flagged down a waiter, and ordered a steak medium rare. I was in a hurry, and when the waiter asked me if I would like a bottle of beer before dinner, I'm afraid I sounded a little curt when I said no. I leaned back, trying to relax, and looked around me. As I let my mind drift, I, I found myself counting, of all things, the bottles of Schlitz beer on the surrounding tables. There were so many, and the people who were drinking Schlitz seemed so pleasant that I began to regret my quick no. You see, I, I couldn't help wondering if Schlitz would taste as good to me as it seemed to taste to the others. So I called my waiter over, told him I'd changed my mind, and asked for a bottle of Schlitz. He was back with my order in a minute. I took a cautious sip, and then another, then a deep swallow. <laughs> How did it taste? Well, the look of satisfaction that spread across my face said it better than any words possibly could. But uh, let me add this just for the record. No wonder Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. No wonder it's the beer that made Milwaukee famous. We find Dr. and Mrs. Hall back at home after the prom, sitting down to a midnight snack with their guest, Abel Kander, Mike's father. This is very kind of you, Doctor. It is so late, I don't... Mr. Kander, I'm very delighted you're here. I'm very proud of that boy of yours. Mikey? Ah, Doctor, don't get me started. That boy. Ah, 
This is the boy. <laughs> you know, I wanted to have a talk with you anyway while you were here. Now, I know it'll take Mike at least half an hour to drive his girl home. She only lives five minutes away. Uh, not, not by the route Mike will take. <laughs> Why, will you? It is spring, Victoria, remember? <laughs> Mr. Kander, um, has Mike ever spoken to you about his uh, plans? Well, yes. Uh, we have talked, of course. But, Doctor, I have a belief about kids. Better they should decide things for themselves. Oh, yes, I agree. He has, however, some other plans for you. Oh, for me? <laughs> well, I'm too old for plans, Doctor. <laughs> when you are 20, you plan for when you are 40. When you are 60, you plan for what you do after breakfast. <laughs> I shouldn't worry about me. Well, she doesn't think you're too old, Mr. Candor. But he feels that perhaps you've missed a lot. Me? Uh, I've missed nothing. <laughs> In my life, I have found a new country, new friends... And where else could I sit with the president of a fine college who is as proud of my son as I am? What am I missing? <laughs> I should run for governor, maybe? <laughs> uh, Mr. Candler, Mike has asked me to enroll you as a student here at Ivy. Enroll me as a student? Yes, to start in the fall, with your permission, of course. Mikey asked you to do this, Doctor? Yes. You think he wants I should come to college? If you would like it. I see. Think about it. Carefully. Talk it over with Mike and, and then decide. Yes. I must think. It is sudden, Doctor. Very sudden. Hey, Dad. Ah. Oh, oh, my. The uh, door was open, Mrs. Hall. Yes, Mike, we left it open for you. Want a sandwich? Oh, no, thanks. I'm afraid it's time for bed. Oh, it's not late. Big day tomorrow, Doctor. Remember, my stag party's tomorrow night. I see no reason whatsoever for stag parties. Me either, Mrs. Hall. <laughs> well, it's not exactly what everybody thinks of as a stag party. It's, uh, it's just that it's for my men friends here at Ivy. Songs and man talk. Women would be bored with it. I can sing. And talk to men, too, for that matter. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't come, Mrs. Hall, but a man only graduates once, you know. You're coming, aren't you, Doctor? Oh, I wouldn't miss it. Where are you holding this disgraceful male outing? At the Brown Buckle, 7.30. Right. <laughs> come on, Dad. Thank you, Mrs. Hall, for a beautiful evening. Good night. Good, good, good night. night. Good night, Mike. Oh, what a dear he is. Yes, but I don't think he's as thought he would be. I know. He looked almost hurt when you told him. Oh, I think he was hurt. Hurt by the sincere gift of a boy thinking only of his father's happiness. Oh, what a strange paradox man is, Vicky. We often wound most cruelly when we give most generously. And he's hurt, all right. And I think I know why. Now, come on, my dear. We need some sleep. <laughs> Toddy? No, thanks, darling. You'll have to shift for yourself this morning, dear. I'll go. Mrs. Hall, forgive me. Mr. Candor. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. I, I should not be here early like this. Oh, come in, come in. I must talk to Dr. Hall. Well, of course. Now, take it easy. You're all out of breath. Go right in. He's alone in the dining room. There's some coffee in there for you. Yes, I will. Thank you. I ran all the way. Well, Mr. Candor, Good morning. I should not come so early, Doctor. Oh, nonsense. You're very welcome at any time. I could not sleep. I, I have been thinking so much. Mm. Have you reached any decision? Yes, Doctor, I have. It was not easy. My boy is going to be very successful, no, Doctor? Oh, I don't think there's any question about it. He's already a success, in fact. Often, when success comes quickly... It is possible that responsibilities can hold somebody back. No? Everyone has responsibilities. Well, uh, money, I, I, I don't mean. But if Mikey has a stone around his neck, it pulls him down. Soon he will go into the world. He will meet people, find people. Like he has met here. People who had schools, had college. Not rough like he grew up with. Well, you don't think that Mike would... 
Well, yes, you probably do. I was worried about this last night. It's true, isn't it? He's ashamed at me. I should have education. I should come here to school. It would be good for Mikey. Yes, Doctor, I made my decision. But not for coming to Ivy. There is an easier way. Well, Mr. Candor, please, please... Please, let me finish. Mikey is a fine son, but I know I've done my part. Well, so is he. It is now finished. When he graduates, he goes along. I will not be in his way. This is your decision, then? Yes, Doctor. It is. Well, Mr. Candor... I spend my life with boys and girls. They are my job, my chosen work. I've learned something about them. Do you know what they are more sensitive about than almost any other one thing? What? The reaction of their friends to their parents. This is what I am talking about, Doctor. No, no. Wait. No, this is the opposite of what you are talking about. Don't you realize that your son invited you to the most important event of his college year? His own senior prom? When all of the parents of all of his friends are here? Don't you see, Mr. Candor? Mike insisted that you be here when he could show you off to everyone. Why, he's so proud of you. It's as if he were your father. Proud? Of me? He's bursting with it. Proud? Of me? All he wants in the world is for you to know that. Proud? Sometimes I think I am a very great fool. Oh, Oh, no, you're not. I would like Mikey never to know how I misjudged him. He won't know, Mr. Candle. I see now why he comes to you for advice, Dr. Horst. It is good, and so are you. I go now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Vicky, I hope you really don't mind my going off to Mike's um, stag party. Of I'm not of a roistering disposition, as you know, and ordinarily, Prexy's presence tends to dam up the flow of undergraduate wit, but Mike is an intelligent young man, and his friends, oh, I'm sure... Oh, come off it, Toddy. <laughs> Uh, what? You're a fraud. Oh. You wouldn't miss this brawl for an autographed edition of Poe's Tamerlane. <laughs> <laughs> so don't try to make me think you're going under protest. Incidentally, there's no way I could sneak in myself, I suppose. <laughs> I doubt it very much. Well? No, nope, my blossom. You stay here and keep my house slippers burning in the window for me. <laughs> One, if by land, and two, if by Grogan the campus cup. <laughs> All right, Tony. I guess if Mike's father can survive the orgy, you can. Was Mike terribly disappointed about his father's decision? Well, like any youngster who has built a lovely picture in his own mind, he hates to have it fade out, but I think he understands. It's nice and rather rare, isn't it, to find a boy who doesn't take his parents' sacrifices for granted. It is nice. But I don't think it's so rare, Vicky. What is rare is to find one who is not only articulate about it, but but who tries to do something prompt and concrete about repayment. Yeah. Well, good night, my darling. I do hope you'll stay up all hours in a rocking chair by the window, tearfully waiting for your wandering boy. Mm. That's the last hope if ever I heard one, Doctor. I have a nice warm bed jacket, a new mystery novel, a small dish of chocolate-covered almonds, and a night clubbing husband. What more could a woman ask? Now, she could ask me to stay at home. Not the way you eat chocolate-covered almonds. <laughs> Good night, Toddy. Have no fun whatsoever. Good night, my sweet. Be miserable. Short one. I have three guests of honor. 
Dr. Hall, our president. A new tune I've written. And my father. Dad? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. A speech maker I am not. But proud and happy I am. A great thing has happened to me here. Mm, I will not forget it. I have been offered a wonderful gift by my son, which I cannot accept. I think this party tonight is maybe the greatest gift of all, to be with him and with his friends. I am proud to be his father. I am maybe prouder even to be his friend. Thanks, Dad. Here's my toast to you. A song, I just finished it. Gentlemen, glasses up. Drink, drink, drink to the fields of gold and grain. Drink, drink, drink to the gentle April rain. Drink to the farmer who grows the hops, the girls who put cats on the bottles. Yes, we're speaking of the fellow who picks up the check letters. Drink, drink, drink to the laughter and the cheer. Drink, drink, drink of the friends no longer here. Drink to the gladness the night bestowed, the wonderful people that you Gentlemen, I have only one thing to say. I know that my candor leaves Ivy to go on to a highly successful career. We here hope we have contributed to it. And we know that you, Mr. Candor, have guided him resolutely toward his destiny, that your faith has never faltered. You belong in this college, sir, and to it. We have discussed this, Mike and his friends and I, and we have decided to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Humanities. Gentlemen, the toast. I give you Dr. Abel Candor of Ivy. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. No wonder it's the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, everyone. Good night. Be sure to see Ronald Coleman's latest picture, Champagne for Caesar. We'll be seeing you next week at this time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Sam Hearn as Abel Kander and Sam Edwards as Mike Kander. Tonight's script was written by Nat Wolf and Don Quinn. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitt Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking. Here, the great Gildersleeve, next on NBC.